This is the Venture Capital Fast Lane. I am your host, Ryan Else, managing partner of Roadster Capital. In the Venture Capital Fast Lane, we will talk about all things fast in venture capital and everything that surrounds it. If it's fast, we're going to talk about it. Growth, exits, funding, cars, rockets, data, software, and much more. We are in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution. So buckle up. This is the Venture Capital Fast Lane. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the Venture Capital Fast Lane. Today, we are going to talk about the space economy with Aaron Burnett, CEO and founder of Spaced Ventures. Uh, Aaron Burnett is the founder and CEO of Spaced Ventures, the planet's first public space investment portal. Since its launch in September 2021, Aaron has mobilized the world's largest community of 8,000 plus space investors to raise or commit to raise over $750,000. With a 10 plus year background in marketing and community building, Aaron is also the creator of the Mars Walkers Pinterest account which is viewed by more than, hold it, 4 million space enthusiasts each month. That's a lot of uh, viewers. So prior to this, Aaron led growth for startups as well as a Fortune 500 company and spent five years teaching, volunteering, and working remotely throughout South America. He is passionate about democratizing access to space investing and getting as many people as possible meaningfully involved in the space innovation ecosystem. Well, Aaron, welcome to the Venture Capital Fast Lane. It is a pleasure to have you as my guest today. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Appreciate the uh, the full bio. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, says, um, it says a lot about uh, a lot about what we do. And I've always been one of those people that tries to have a little bit more fun with my bios uh, rather than the uh, you know the traditional you know long list of. I've done X, Y, or Z, 100 million things. So <laughs> hopefully no, people I, appreciate that. I think that. It's, it is a uh, really great piece of color that uh, gives us all a, a clear understanding of you from a, a true 360 degree perspective. <laughs> and I, I think it's really nice to have that. So good, good on you for that one. So today we're going to walk through a, a few things and touch on the space economy and definitely speak about space ventures. And so I'm gonna, I'll ask you a few questions and uh, let's see how this goes. Awesome. So, Looking forward to it. Great. So, you know, the, the race to commercialize space is moving faster today than ever before. So you have the pulse on the space economy. What was it that catalyzed your interest in space and how did it lead to space ventures? Yeah. So, you know, like many people, space science fiction and stuff was just part of the way I grew up and it was all, but it was always very futuristic, you know, something that I probably would never see. You know, that was always the, the thought process. So it's great for escaping, you know, the real world, but the real world was a lot more boring. Um, and then that kind of all changed when I saw the Falcon Heavy landing uh, on a live stream. I was actually in Ecuador at the time watching a, uh, you know, Falcon Heavy launch a Tesla into space and these boosters come landing side by side. That's a fairly iconic image at this point. Um, but that to me really crystallized the idea that, it, you know, science fiction is not really fiction anymore. Like we're seeing some crazy stuff that I would have expected to read about or see on a TV show or something. And so now it's just very cool. And I, and I wanted to be a part of that industry and it kind of just reawoken that passion in me uh, for, for the industry, for space in general. Um, and so that really helped to, you know, push me forward and say, I need to be a part of it. And so, you know, it, that was a several year journey of trying to figure out how I can help, how I can be a part, how I can use my talents um, in the industry. Uh, one thing led to another. Uh, you know, I've been investing since I was 12. I have a brokerage account, a custodial brokerage account of all things. Um, as a 12-year-old, bad time to be doing that. It was a good time to learn, but bad time to be investing as a 12-year-old right around the, the internet bubble. <laughs> um, but uh, so, you know, the, the interest in, in investing was there. The interest in space and, and the industry and, and just the future of space was there. Um, and then kind of the skill set was, hey, how can we build a large community of investors who will push this industry forward, both with money and attention and interest, uh, and, you know, and making the, uh, you know, the industry happen. I mean, we're, you know, eventually, the history of humanity is if there's enough people together that want something to happen, we'll make it happen one way or the other. Um, and so I want to create that community uh, with both dollars and with, um, 
you know, skill sets and, and, and interests. Wow, that's that's quite intriguing and and what a journey. It's always great to have a, a brokerage account, a custodial one when you're 12 because it then it, if you're if your folks are pointing you in the right direction, you can go and and buy Disney and all the other things that that you are seeing <laughs> in real life and 20 20 years later uh, as that uh, materializes, it compounds and it you know, hopefully it's worth <laughs> worth well over a million dollars by the time you're 62. Okay. Exactly, right? Yeah. <laughs> So, um, well, so space tech, space tech, sorry, is expected to be a 10 trillion US dollar market by the year 2030. That's not too far away at this point. And like you were saying, uh, a lot is happening at a very fast pace. So from my perspective, space tech does enable global economies. So from what regions of the world do you expect founders will move at the speed of light to capitalize on the opportunity that is space? Yeah, you know, um, regions of the world and space in general, this is a very interesting topic, right? Because, you know, the world still has borders as we see it. Uh, borders at the end of the day are kind of things that we'd all just agree upon <laughs> exist. Many times there are physical, uh, you know, limitations to a border like a river or something, but other times it's just a line that, you know, we've agreed upon is a, um, you know, is, is something that divides us from them, right? So there is a lot of that in our history and, our, and in our culture, um, the us and them kind of mentality. Space has a very, very it, it, there's really just one border. It's like us on earth and them or whatever else is out there. Right? Um, so it's a different type of way of thinking about things. So space naturally has a way of, you know, uh, bringing and unifying, you know, humans together from different nationalities. Um, right now, we're in, a, in an interesting time where, you know, there's a lot of things going on in Ukraine and a lot of this, you know, us versus them mentality that exists, you know, in, in, in wars and things like that. So how are we, you know, bridging that gap? I, I don't think it's going to be an obvious and very simple transition. I'm sure there's going to be quite a bit of politici politicization that happens uh, and still boundaries that are being drawn Um and just rules that are being, you know, created. So with that in mind, right, this is not all that simple. So with regions of the world right now, a lot of the money that is able to be had, I wouldn't quote myself on this, but something like 50% of all, you know, money that's out there from, from a revenue perspective is, is coming from the U.S. because there's a lot of investment dollars from DOD, from uh, Space Force, right, or from NASA and things like that, that do tend to go into large contractors and trickle out into the into the economy. So that's a substantial portion of what the space industry is today. There's a growing commercial interest, though. And as we've seen with, you know, what's happening in Ukraine, uh, there's a lot of attention being paid to Earth observation companies where they can actually, you know, look down and view what's happening. And there's a lot of transparency where that, you know, might have been a politicized thing before. You could, in theory, just pay a company to tell you what's actually happening right now. So there's journalists, you know, going out to Planet and all these other companies that are doing some interesting things. Um, so, you know, I guess it's not a simple answer. I don't have an answer. I'm not sure anyone really does. But when it comes to, you know, the growth that's happening regionally, I do think that, you know, there's a lot of incentive for companies to move to the U.S. to capture revenue. Uh, um, there's a lot of that happening. Um, but, you know, there's really no reason why it can't happen in a lot of different places. And probably a lot of the alpha exists in some places that you don't really think of. And as the cost of launch comes down, it's becoming more accessible all over the globe. Yeah, I think given the the, the geopolitical um, risks that are going on right now, what we're seeing in the world, Russia used to be kind of one of these big powers in space, and now it seems like they're they just aren't going to be any any longer, or, or yeah. not not for the foreseeable future. I think um, I'm, I have seen and heard of a few op things coming out of India of all places from mm -hmm. rocket launch. There's definitely going to be some alpha there. And yeah, yeah I, I agree with you. There's no real pin that you can put on the map where it makes the most sense, especially with the advent of COVID and accelerating things, work from home and the like. Yeah. Uh, I think we might see stuff pop up from all over the place. So what better place to give these companies the opportunity to raise capital should they not have access to traditional funding mechanisms right out of yeah. the gate? than on a platform that's core focus is space, like space ventures. Yeah, um, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons. Like it will take, it would take, you know, a very long time for, you know, humanity to not have this idea of like, you know, countries and states and us versus them. 
who knows where we end up in 20, 50, 100 years from now. But, you know, with that in mind, there's still going to be this interest in, you know, let's launch with our own companies from our, within our own borders, right? We don't have to go ship everything over to SpaceX in the U.S. because um, there's all sorts of things to deal with with that, you know, financially and, you know, politically. So it, there's always going to be these, these kind of interests. Um, you know, launch is one of these limiting mechanisms because it's essentially like, you know, the railroads to space, right? So, so you kind of have to go where you can get, you know, the ride. And so right now it is a limiting mechanism. It's one of the key reasons why SpaceX is so important um, and why them being, having spent, you know, hundreds of millions early on uh, bootstrapping essentially as much as you can bootstrap a space company themselves working off of government contracts eventually and then becoming a, a really big, big supplier is such an, it's such an important deal now because you look at Russia who's cut off ties to their, you know, railroad to space, right, with uh, many countries. So what would have happened if that didn't exist, right? It's kind of like a scary potential world where, you know, an entire industry is cut off. So I think that as that matures and develops, you have more, you know, decentralization on where you can get access to space. There's new technologies that are coming up where, you know, cargo and things like that, especially small stuff can get into space much easier and potentially cheaper because there's things like Spin Launch and uh, other companies that we're working with as well that are shooting things up without rockets, right? How are they doing that? Like, we'll see if that, that, that works out in the end, but it's a lot of cool things happening in the industry. Yeah, that spin launch is really impressive. I just can't believe what they've been putting together. So, yeah. um, so there are a handful of crowdfunding platforms out there, but why create one with the core focus on financing the space economy? And, and I think more importantly, or maybe equally important, is how do you convince a founding team to choose your platform over another? And what type of diligence does your team do prior to listing them on your platform? Yes, yeah, so this is a pretty, you know, several facets and deep question. Um, so I appreciate it. Um, you know, cr a crowdfunding platform right now, the kind of the market that exists, is they're all industry agnostic, really, with large groups of people. So you could literally be sitting next to, you could have a space company, and this does exist. It's like a space company sitting next to, a, I don't know, some kind of consumer app sitting next to some kind of, artisanal soda and a craft brewing group you know it, there's and a, not a, and a lot water of, like a, and a a cooler with a, a beer yeah. koozie tied to it and a, a radio inside of it <laughs> <laughs> exactly right which yeah. um it, it doesn't it, there's a lot of noise inherently just because there's different things they all could be i'm not saying anything about quality yet right they all could be in theory high quality in their specific sectors but you as an investor an angel investor you know with the angel investor hat on you know are you going through that one by one and, 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 and trying to do the due diligence on all that? I mean, generally speaking, angels, and this is true of myself, you, you invest in things you kind of want to see happen uh, because it's a very early stage, a lot of risk. You, you obviously want an ROI attached to it, but there's a lot of angels that are thinking about this as, you know, I invest in things I'm comfortable with or I want to see happen or I'm going to just do the research on for fun, right? <laughs> you right. may or may not actually want to go do the research on another artisanal soda of what the market looks like and all that stuff you may it was great but if not you know you, you may have those so we're looking essentially for the people that investors that are already following all the spacex events and that, and that kind of thing understanding the market is as deeply as they can because it's fun um right it's almost you know it's almost like you're going to spend your fun time on it in addition to uh you know investing in it so you know, I think that's one aspect of it. A focus really provides us the ability to do two things. One is focus our due diligence on a higher quality, you know, what we believe to be a higher quality, you know, subset of space companies. And then also focus our investor community on people that are far more interested in this, are doing this for fun and are, are interested in the industry at large. So you have, uh, in theory, what is a better investor, a better fan, a more connected, uh, you know, investor as well, adding higher value. So we see that uh, that focus gives us a few superpowers um, that other I mean, different platforms may not be able to provide. Um, they have to worry about being available to everyone at totally different stories and all this stuff. We don't have to worry about that. Yeah, that's a great answer. I, so, so how does space vent or does space ventures have a fund that selectively invests in these companies that are listed on the space ventures platform? We, we don't currently. Um, you know, they're there's obviously opportunities for things like that into the future. I uh, have to be concerned about, you know, um, securities laws and making sure that it's all 
you know, above board. And something that I, the last question I failed to um, answer, um, and not by, not on purpose, was the question about founder selectivity. So what we yeah. found, by the way, and this kind of comes into this question as well, what we found is, you know, it's not hard to pitch an industry specific platform, right? It is, they, they have to have some trust that we're able to deliver uh, you know, the, the investments up front, uh, essentially, as quickly as possible. But if you're familiar with the crowdfunding industry, it's really, a, you know, good luck. It's kind of a wild west. You put your stuff out there, put all the effort and stuff into it, and you see if people are interested. And it kind of goes out into a very noisy marketplace. Um, so getting above that noise often is left to the founders or the companies to market themselves and things like that. So because inherently we have less noise, um, all of our, you know, most of our investors are seeing these deals. They may not stop everything to go look at it, right? Um, so it may take some time, but most of our investors are seeing these because there's less to look at, right? And they know if it's something coming from space ventures, it's a space deal and in theory, a high quality one. So, you know, with that in mind, it's a different frame. And so we're able to, you know, so far we're batting hundred percent. We have four deals come through the platform. They've all raised over a hundred thousand. Some are pushing 400, some are pushing 300. Um, now, and, and we're about to push across the mark, we'll see when this happens sooner or later, uh, having raised a million uh, across the platform for space companies. So this will all, you know, it's early days, it's all that flywheel is still starting to take effect, but that's a, just a different, ultimately a different value proposition. So founders get that. And then the other thing that inherently happens is we have people like, you know, strategic investors, right beyond Northrop Grumman, you know, <laughs> the industry <laughs> comes to us because that's all we look at, right? So they're, well, I wanna talk to the people you're talking to. Um, sometimes it overlap, um, but as the industry grows and becomes more you know, noisy, there's a lot more companies out there. It's more valuable to have someone who that's all they look at, right? To, to kind of help filter for you. So we have a strategic angle with founders as well that is not considered, a crowdfunding platform is not considered strategic. It's considered often case dumb money. We are trying to yeah. position ourselves as the smartest money you can get, even if it's angel investing. You know, I think that makes really great qualitative sense because a, a strategic corporate has to has to funnel through all of this noise. If they have an area they can go to where it's just its core focus is their interest, like the Raytheons of the world look or Boeing's, let's say, they're going to look here and see what's on that platform. It gives them an added an added flavor but with without the distraction of the fizz if you will yeah. and they can just get right to it and they can they can either choose to make an early investment or at least they can at the develop that strategic relationship and build trust over time with them even at their earliest stages and open these companies mm -hmm. open the door for these companies to have a, a platform for for potential future interest partnerships and growth and yeah yeah, I, this makes perfect sense. I, there is a ton of noise on, on these other platforms. We don't even need to name them. Uh, anyone listening yeah. to the show knows who they are, uh, but there's so much noise and you're right. There is a lot of a lot of dumb money and there are also people on those platforms who are on there to say they're on, but they're not even investing anything. So, yeah. you know, if you, depending on what platform it is, there's just a lot of deadbeats, if you will, deadbeat investors yeah. that are there to kind of, it's a vanity metric. Yeah. It, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I mean, there's noise in general. There's a lot of deals. There's a lot of movement towards, um, you know, towards private equity alternative investments. I think that's, and I don't want to oversimplify, but I do think that's kind of a millennial trait, um, including myself, right? I've been looking for alternative investments since I was essentially 14, a couple of years after realizing that my tiny little check means very little. I could just Put it in and walk away come back 10 years later or <laughs> uh, i hope to compete against day traders and you know large quantitative uh you know <laughs> uh you know computers yeah, and people's funds. yeah quant funds things like that how am i going to compete against that so alternative is quite interesting i think i think that's essentially a millennial trait you see a lot of movement you see things what's happened with gamestop and ame you can come in and, and the power of a crowd can happen in a public market but being able to take things off and look for alternative opportunities, um, it, you know, I think people are starting to wake up to that. And that's a lot of movement in that direction. So, you know, we want to be there to help, you know, focus. I mean, the, the, the focus is quite, is quite powerful <laughs> with just all the noise that's out there in general, like social media and everything. I mean, you could just talk about, you just, we're hitting, we're having notifications all day long. So if you can just focus your context of, I mean, looking at a space investment, 
I'm going to a space investment place. Um, it really helps. And then, you know, the other thing is that, you know, fundamentally, the risks uh, of space really align with really small check sizes at early stages, right? So you're talking 100 $250 check sizes. If you're putting in something that small, you're okay with losing it, right? Like in theory, right? There's most people will not be able to, you know, uh, you know, will not be able to lose a 10,000, 25,000 or a hundred thousand dollar checks. VCs, right? In theory, they're playing with other people's money as you're aware, but at the same time, you know, your whole business can collapse if you make a wrong decision on a million dollar check size or something. So you have to be quite, quite considerate. So early stage investment into a space company that's pre-revenue aligns quite well with lots of people coming in at really small check sizes, um, you know, just because that that risk individually can be borne by individuals rather than, um, you know, one massive check. So it means a lot for the company, means that they could be successful, but you're just able to have a, a different, you know, kind of perspective when individually you're making a 250 or $2,000 decision rather than a $200,000 decision. Yeah. And you know, I mean, you, what it's, it's a lot easier to lose 250 dollars than it is to lose two hundred fifty thousand dollars or yeah. um, 1.5 or whatever it might be but you know one exactly. thing you, you you said you talked about vcs playing with other people's money i mean in some essence that's there's truth to that but at the same yeah. time i i also just want to say there are table stakes for all the vc funds so for mm -hmm. myself in particular i've got money in the fund as well i mean i have to the lps expect uh to have yeah. skin in the game but uh in the grand it's, it's your things, own money you know, talk, and even it's you still, leverage it up with other yeah, people's money, right? Yeah. But exactly. even so, like it, my my point is is actually the, the reverse, right? So using other people's money, it's actually more difficult for you to write a 250k check because not not because oh I just do whatever I want with other people's money. And there are some people that approach it that way. Let's be honest. But that's true. Um, the you know it doesn't that that's not the point. The point is is you have an IRR to think about, right? You need to report back to your LPs, and so. You make a you make a series. It doesn't have to be a lot. You can make a one or two really dumb decisions with a with a significant check size. You know you have to do a different level of scrutiny, and that's why most founders in space hear the same story over and over again. We heard this pattern very early. It took me five to figure out there was a pattern, but after fifty, I you know quantitatively proved there was a pattern, which is they hear come back when you have revenue consistently, and in, in the SaaS market, that's great because bootstrapping to revenue is not that difficult or you know, friends and family to revenue is not that difficult. Going from in space, you know, friends <laughs> getting to revenue can often take, you know, uh, you know, can take one to $5 million. It depends on the company, of course, and what they're doing, but because of hard, they're doing hardware of many cases, there's a launch involved, there's a lot of risk involved. You send one thing up into space to do the thing you said you were gonna do, and you have one of 12,000 different things that can go wrong, go wrong. All of a sudden it's like, well, you know, we're done, right? We're done. Yeah. <laughs> so we're getting done. to that, getting to that level of uh, risk calculation is very hard for large check sizes to come in and do. And there are people that are doing that. But even so, you see a lot of that, that very early stage investment is very, it, it's just not there for most space companies early on, it's pre revenue specifically. So that's why I like aligning pre revenue. We don't have just pre revenue on the platform. The cool thing about the CF exemption is you can use it whenever. So, I, you know, if I can get Elon, I would love to have a conversation with him, right? To get to do a CF, he can do it. It's series whatever they're at. You know, there's probably a double A at this point. I don't know, um, but you know, he can line up and do a CF, you know, round as well. And it just it just allows access to retail investors um, you know, to have a primary access to the. Uh, it's still one line item in the cap table and all that, but he could do that. So we we have multiple use cases, but those early stage, a lot of cases, this is just a much easier opportunity to say, hey. We all understand this is highly risky, but you know we can all risk much smaller check sizes. So come on in. Yeah, risk risk is all is the real name of the game, and uh, the other piece of it is being a, a fiduciary. So it, it's exactly. a lot easier to be a fiduciary on two hundred and fifty bucks. <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. Well, so yeah. so you know a few of the space economy companies that really have me anticipating big things are many that you've mentioned already, such as SpaceX or Varda Space or Axiom yeah. Space, who we just saw the AX1 crew go up yeah. into space on the the railway to space through SpaceX, um, mm -hmm. Relativity Space, Planet, Starlink. I mean, do any of these really stand out to you, or is there one we might want to be keeping a close eye on that is currently listed on your platform? 
Yeah, I see. so you know, in general, like if you're talking about publicly traded securities, right? There's a, some there are publicly traded stocks or some of these out there. There's tends to be quite a few earth observation companies out there, and that is just a broad category for anyone that's got some kind of sensor looking back at Earth. So it can be like a, a photo, you know, a photo. They can be taking photos of Earth, like planet, or they could be doing synthetic aperture radar, which is essentially a, a, a I mean, I'm going to oversimplify, but a visual that comes from radar as uh, so it's like kind of like its own way of picture. There's hyperspectral companies, all sorts of different sensors you can put up there, wind data and things like that. That's big for weather prediction. Um, so a lot of those are out there. And that's already like if you're worried about revenue, right, that's already a big, big market. And they don't necessarily have to rely on government. Low Earth orbit can already rely on a commercial, relatively large commercial appetite, large and growing. Uh, for data. Whereas like a, you know, like a SpaceX, great company. I don't even know if they'll go public <laughs> anytime soon. They're going to spin off Starlink to be a public company, right? But that's essentially the same kind of thing. They're selling data down to consumers, which is, you know, internet. Um, but that's what they're selling different than a, you know, SpaceX, which they're, a lot of their market is coming from large commercial contracts or are commercial companies they're lining up. But, you know, if you take away the government, as a, as, a, as a key source of revenue for SpaceX. And it's a very different looking company. Um, and they're probably going to use a lot of that to get to being interplanetary. So from a perspective of companies and things like that, um, I think there's a lot of options um, out there. You know, one of the things that we like to look at on our platform, because we are private equity, right? So we are still retail access or, you know, anyone can invest in these companies, but they are private. So they're still quite early. So we tend to look at the next three, five, even 10 years in some cases, most of the time it's three to five years we're looking at. And the, the cool things that are happening right now, I think are in orbital servicing. Um, so this has been, uh, think about, uh, you know, essentially, you know, ISS is up there, really right. government operated. In the last year, they've announced that there's going to be three more axioms putting a space station up. There's three more that won contracts as well. Uh, you know, Orbital Reef, which is Blue Origin and Sierra, or you have, um, uh, the uh, Star Lab team, which is Voyager and NanoRax and uh, Lockheed Martin Group, they're putting these commercial space stations that owned and operated and, you know, selling space and research space and people coming in to the private, you know, industry. So that means there's a lot going on that most people aren't aware of. There's things happening in orbit where they're just really all transactions will happen in orbit. Right. That's it. Like uh, it, it, this isn't they'll, they'll shoot something up there, but really the, the whole business is supposed to happen there. So there's a whole servicing economy being built there. You know, one is like gas stations in space with orbit path. You know, this is an early company that is private that we're working to try and get on the platform if we can. Right. Um, but they're selling an actual literal gas station in space. So they sell gas in space. Right. Um, the, the fact that that exists blows most people most people's minds, but there's actually one orbiting above our heads. It's not just a, a pipe dream. There's already they're already doing it. They're already selling you know futures contracts on um, fuel. So there's a lot of cool stuff like that. You know, on our platform, we think how can things help to facilitate stuff like that. So we've got a company like Infinite Composites doing pressure vessels. So <laughs> you got gas. You know, they're doing a, a composite pressure vessel. It's one of the first and, and most efficient in the industry to be able to do all composite. What's cool about that though and in a company like that and you use them as an example is they have the ability to operate in space and make quite quite good margins with really heavily engineered products and they're also able to take that as they start to scale up with their materials they're able to take that and put it on earth and you know explore contracts with airliners right who care about efficiency but not aren't willing to pay as much as a rocket would <laughs> right. right so as that scales down it becomes more accessible everywhere on earth and then all of a sudden, potentially one of their massive opportunities is like the hydrogen economy, right? Hydrogen being stored in pressure vessels all over. You could have it in a car even, right? So you need to have efficiency in mind, but they can get to a scale where it becomes cost competitive in general. Um, so this sort of thing happens. Uh, it's very, it's hard to look at in space as a, as a true isolated industry, it space is a place where industry happens. <laughs> so you've got you need a train uh, like that. That's a good. Yeah, one. I, I, I do say that quite often. You know, it, other people have said it. I'm not the first person I've ever said. It. Maybe I just rhyme better. I don't know. But you know, that's that's really what uh, the, what it is. So you you see things happen all the time. GPS went up because they needed to do stuff in DoD, and now we all use it every day to order 
Ubers and, and food. You know, um, same with camera phones. They, they were really focused on miniaturizing cameras and that, that led to the, what is, you know, the now very common camera phone uh, industry and smartphone industry. Um, it, this is, there's a constant and long history of this, but, you know, even a composite is a good example. Um, essentially anyone on our platform would have, you know, translation back down to earth at some point. So if that's robust economies are going to be built, but there's going to be blurry line between what is space? Are they just space enabled and they operate in space, but they sell stuff on earth? Um, that definition is kind of hard to hard to come by sometimes, but that's what we get excited about when we see opportunities where we can be risky for investors because, you know, they may be cutting their teeth in space and bringing something back to earth or vice versa. It happens all the time. Yeah, you know, I, I think as critical a component as space is to, to what the future of hum humanity will hold, I my belief is that the, the cost is so exorbitant that, that VC private equity is critical and always mm -hmm. has been, but the governments uh, as a whole are going to have to adopt space into their overall infrastructure plans and budgets yeah. in order to truly truly make this exactly what it is going to be. I think that will happen uh, probably over the next decade. We'll start to see a lot more. I mean, you, you touched on Space yeah. Force earlier, which you know, I'll ask you a question about that in a minute. But yeah, it, there, there's exponential opportunity. We're just, we're just at the very beginning of it from my perspective. It's, it took a couple yeah. decades to convince anyone that NASA knew what they were doing um, <laughs> and to convince most people that we landed on the moon. And now, and now we're sending we're sending uh, things up to Mars. So it's yeah. there's a lot there's a lot in front of us. And the beauty of it is there is a very clear roadmap on how to get there. Yeah, precisely. So, so at, at last check, you had uh, just over eight thousand registered users on the platform. How did yeah. you do that so quickly? And uh, how long did it really take to get there? You know, um, so we. So the first year of our existence was essentially understanding the market, building up the the uh, the, the initial MVP and getting a license. You know, because we have to have a license with um, be a member of Finra and, and uh, you know registered SEC um, funding portal. I believe is the de definition or the, the the name there. Um, so we had to go through all that process. So it's not like no such thing as a real MVP <laughs> right. in, in that world. So it took us about a year to do that, and then um, from I think we got our license May 19th or so. So it took us about, we took about a month to launch that out and, and start our first deal. We we're in a very quiet kind of private beta uh, for the first three months and then opened it up in September of last year. So you're talking about six, seven months um, since we really opened this up to be, it still is a public beta, meaning all sorts of things we need to fix. There's probably going to be a, a, a bug here or there. You know, it, it's just one of these things as we're still growing, rolling this out. We take a lot of pride in building really good product, but we're still in this kind of public beta phase because it's all just, but, you know, there's things I want to add, payment options and things like that that we just need to have, you know, uh, yeah. that will be when it's fully complete. <laughs> we may be in beta phase for, you know, uh, more than a year from now, but who knows? Um, so that's where we're at. When we started, it's been about six or seven months since that public beta really opened. And we've grown to about 8,000, I think 500 is what we crossed today or last night. Um, and that's been, you know, primarily driven just by, you know, space is quite interesting, <laughs> right? So most people have some kind of interest in space. There's a lot of folks that, you know, who could care less as far as investing are concerned, but we just try and be quite focused with our messaging. Uh, I, I don't think you come to our site and are confused about the fact that there's space investing happening here, <laughs> Yeah. right? So it's, it's pretty obvious. We're, we're pretty clear. We're not going to be for everybody, but you know, we do believe this is a million person community at some point. You know, I, I'm, I'm impatient. I want this to already be a hundred thousand uh, because that's the kind of excitement and passion I have. I know there's quite a bit of passion out there, but it'll take some time as we build trust it just at large, right. Um, to, to build that up. But yeah, it's been going. Um, I'm never happy with the numbers. I always wanted to be faster. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. but you know, looking back in hindsight, it's, it's cool to see that we've been able to get this far, um, this fast, uh, put something out there that people actually want and have real investment dollars coming in. Because yeah, at the end of the day, we are, why would anyone trust us to, to put out the best deals? You know, we, we work uh, a lot and we work quite hard to find through hundreds of space companies to find what we believe are the best 
who are interested in, in doing a, you know, a public allocation and, and putting that out there to the public. It takes time. It takes effort. It's, it's a, it's a grind. <laughs> so putting that all out there, we're, we're excited that people are responding. We're, we're excited that, you know, almost a million has been raised through the platform to date and we'll continue to go from there. I look forward to when I can say it's 10 and then a hundred million and then a billion. I mean, all those numbers will be cool to cross at some point. I think it's just a matter of time. Yeah, I, I think you're right. So I, I've got a fun question for you. Uh, do you have a favorite sci-fi movie character or quote? Uh, you know, I think it's always changing. What I grew up on was Stargate SG-1, which is like very fanciful. Yeah. <laughs> I just happened to grow up on that. So, you know, I, you know, any of the characters there are just, you know, cool um, and, and kind of cool to, to work with. Um or cool to think about and watch. I just re, you know, I, I like re binged it, uh, you know, uh, a while ago. It came up on Netflix, you know, a year or two ago. So I was like, you know, watching it in the background for a while. It's just fun memories. Um, and then, so that's that's something I grew up on, which is a weird one. It's normally it's Star Wars or Star Trek, right? <laughs> of course, I love those. I love both of them. Um, and then the more recent one is The Expanse, which is just really cool because it feels a lot more tangible. And I mean, I know of companies working on actual tech that is being used uh it, it, that is you know described in that series of books and, and in the movies uh the the expanse series so um you know things like magnetic boots and fusion drives and stuff like, like there's actual people working on this stuff so he, i think the author really tried to focus on what's really achievable within known physics um so it was kind of cool uh to see that that's it feels you know it's a little bit you know um, it's not quite the utopian future I would like to see, <laughs> but it is, uh, you know, kind of a cool future. I think it feels achievable. Um, so I want to make that happen without the, you know, the, the, the class warfare and, and this, you know, the weird things that happened in that movie. I want to make the, the technology happen within 50 years instead of waiting what I think they say like 150 or 200 years from now. Right. Yeah. I think, I think those are great ones. I think for me, uh, I, just for the purpose of this episode, I think I'm going to have to go with Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, because <laughs> I just, I love that movie. Um, and I think my favorite quote in there uh, by Khan, played by Ricardo Monteblon, was, uh, ah, Kirk, my old friend, do you know the, the Klingon proverb that tells us revenge is a, a dish that is best served cold? It is very cold in space. Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's kind of the it's kind of the the idea is like I think that's part of the unifying fact of space. You see a lot of that with people going up and looking down on Earth, um, but the void itself is quite uh, you know it, it's quite an enemy uh, to uh, life in general. So I think a, a lot of humanity tends to think you know when you start working against that, it, it is you know us versus the void in many cases. So it does have kind of a unifying effect of the con common enemy of space being just a very harsh place for any human or life in general, other than like tardigrades to exist. So do you have uh, thoughts on the United States Space Force? I, I can tell you my first thought when it was announced was what type, what type of a joke is this? Yeah. Um, but as I <laughs> looked into it deeper, uh, uh, I come to realize this is no joke. There's a lot more behind it, just that the delivery was pretty poor. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it does. It felt like a, you know, kind of a a joke sort of announcement, um, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, how many names did they actually have to be able to, <laughs> to use, you know, with space and, you know, uh, you know, they already had the Air Force and it's like, how do you, how do you, how do you name it? I don't know. Um, what I really like about it is, uh, yeah, as I started to think deeper and look in deeper into it, it's really cool that we have what is essentially now a budget that is equal to the size of NASA's. And so NASA more, you know, technology and science and exploration focused, whereas Space Force is going to be more DOD focused. But it, this has always been the elephant in the room. Everyone's like, why are we spending a billion dollars on a rocket when we could fund 100 schools or something? You know, they, they always throw these like weird straw man, red herring, whatever arguments out there. And it's just, well, just OK, if you really want to pick, you can pick any random thing and look at it as a waste. But that is like delivering far and beyond a greater ROI to us and humanity in general than you know, other things. But the DOD budget has always been massive. Um, and there's reasons for it, right? Uh, but it's kind of cool to be able to carve a piece out of that that is specifically designated to space, space technology, space defense. So now what you see is you know, almost two NASA-sized budgets devoted to space technology specifically. 
um, and operating in space and thinking about space. So what that effectively does is create a lot more opportunity for you know, space uh, companies to find government contracts, to find R&D. There's a lot of not a lot more R&D happening, uh, early stage R&D for, for space stuff. There's already stuff happening with Air Force. Air Force has always been doing some space things, but having it pulled aside, designated specifically for that is, is I think a really uh, positive step um, because there's always gonna be a government kind of handoff that happens yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, over time, especially the further you get from earth, the more that's important, right? So right now, low earth orbit, you could almost argue we don't need to be there at all with, with government. The government's already kind of saying, we're gonna take off uh, ISS and we're gonna let commercial entities do that. We're gonna focus on cislunar and lunar kind of stuff. And then maybe we, you know, uh, Mars, so the government, you know, that kind of budget can really push us further and further out and really focus on more of the exploration science and, you know, technology development. And then we as a commercial entity can start to pull in and make it happen uh, from, you know, closer uh, and it'll always be like one or two rings behind. Yeah. Huh. So, hey, so, you know, you're on the venture capital fast lane. What comes to mind when you think of going fast? You know, I think, well, you know, obviously rockets and, and, and launching to space is always a cool thing. Uh, but when it comes to, uh, you know, what's going fast in the industry, I would just say, um, you know, early stage funding has got a lot of exciting things happening. Um, and so, you know, when it comes, when I think of fast in space, I think of the next space markets. I'm kind of <laughs> single track mind, unfortunately. <laughs> so well, you've got a single track focused platform, yeah. so why not? You know, go with it. Exactly. Really, yeah, own it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not not a, whoops, sorry. I had a weird thing happen there. My stool just fell on me. Um, yeah, it's it's not a, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a fun, it's kind of a fun thing. You know, there's a lot of markets developing in space. It's almost too hard to keep track of. Um, orbital servicing, uh, propulsion technology, all this stuff is, is just moving really fast. Um, so, you know, that's what I think of, you know, bring in dollars, help help it, and uh, let's get us faster to to, to Mars <laughs> and uh, beyond. Yeah, well, that's, that's great. Yeah, faster to Mars. And on that note, <laughs> final question for you. Uh, your Pinterest account, Mars Walkers, is viewed mm -hmm. by more than 4 million space enthusiasts each month. I, that is astounding. So, in the words of David Bowie, what do you think? Awesome. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, you know, when, we, when I was doing that, by the way, that was just a, uh, it was a thing to like kind of have an outlet for content creation around Mars. And I knew that, uh, or not just Mars, but you know, space in general. Um, and it, there wasn't anyone doing it on Pinterest. It was my wife who told me to do it on Pinterest. It's like, ah, that's for, that's for girls or something, you know, some weird, uh, you know, preconceived notion I had. Um, so we did that. And that was a huge reason. It was a huge proof point for me to say, look, there's a lot of people interested. I'm not the only weird nerd, you know, that wants to be involved in space. So I think there's a certain percentage of these people that are quite interested in investing. And, you know, that worked really well <laughs> for us. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited. And uh, that's a, yeah, that's a great classic. I, I, I always think of that. I think of the, uh, of the, the Falcon, the Falcon heavy launch that took the uh, Tesla, because that's always the iconic, you know, kind of uh, David Bowie, you know, soundtrack that played right when things were opening. <laughs> I love it too, because it, it, it was a roadster and for yeah. roadster capital. So bravo. Yeah to the entire <laughs> Tesla team for sending up a roadster. Awesome. <laughs> so, well, that'll do it. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for driving in the fast lane. Until next time, I'm your host, Ryan Else, and this is the Venture Capital Fast Lane. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you.